and welcome to the broadcast today. I'm Pastor Richard Rodriguez. I'm the senior pastor here at Christian Life Center Church in beautiful Kingwood, Texas. And once again, I'm coming to you from our garden area. It's a beautiful area where on a sunny day like today, you can come out. And I love to come out here and just pray when I have some time alone early in the mornings. And of course, the children come out here. We have a beautiful playground for the kiddos. We have a private school and a daycare center. And I want to encourage you, if you're looking for a child care center or a school for your children, give us a call. The, the phone number is 281 281- 319-4673. That's 281-319-4673. We'd love to hear from you. In just a few moments, I'm going to be sharing a message that I've entitled, Standing in the Midst of a Storm. Standing in the Midst of a Storm. But before I do, I want to encourage you to do something. And that is, I want you to sow a seed into this ministry. Now you might say, well, Pastor, what do you mean sow a seed? Well, see, God tells us in the book of Malachi, I believe it's chapter 3, He says, bring the tithe into the storehouse. Well, what does that mean? The word tithe is an interesting biblical word. It simply means one-tenth. See, the number 10 is a, an important Bible number. It's a covenant number. When God was going to deliver the Hebrews out of Egyptian slavery, he used 10 plagues. And when he gave us his commandments, all the law of God, everything that God wants us to, to understand and learn, he summed up into 10 commandments. Because with those 10, you can make the whole. Amen? That's kind of like a seed. In fact, in the last days, he says there'll be an, a, a government that's going to rule the entire world, and it's going to be a ten-nation confederation. Because ten is like a seed. It represents the full potential. Uh, I could give you another example, our numbering system. You know, we have ten digits, and with those ten digits, you can make any number. And that's how it is with a seed. You know, you can take an apple and cut it in half, and, and you can count the number of seeds that are in an apple. But you can't count the number of apples that are in a seed. Because a seed is a tool of mass production. With one seed, you can grow an apple tree. And that apple tree will produce hundreds, maybe thousands of apples that can produce an apple orchard, that can produce an apple company that makes applesauce and apple juice and apple slices and apple pie. The potential is practically unlimited. That's what happens when you sow a seed. And I often ask our members, what's in your wallet? See, because when God says bring the tithe, it's an interesting thing. He doesn't say give the tithe. He says bring the tithe because the tithe belongs to him. God says that the, the tithe belongs to him. If you don't bring it, he says, you're robbing me. It'd be sort of like if I gave one of my employees a, a $40 and I said, hey, go buy me a sandwich at the sandwich shop and uh, you can keep the, the change. Just bring me the sandwich. And they go to the shop and they buy the sandwich and on the way back, they say, boy, it really looks good. And they eat it. Well, then they've robbed me. I mean, I gave them everything that they had and all I asked for was a little portion back. That's what God did. See, the earth is the Lord's. This beautiful place, it's all the Lord's. I know that. I'm just a caretaker of it while I'm here. The earth is the Lord's in the fullness of, thereof. And all he says is bring a tenth in, a tithe in. And so I want to encourage you to pay your tithe. And you don't have to pay it here. If you have a home church, then, then honor them and bring your tithe to the church. If you'd like to give here, you can. The easiest way to give a tithe or an offering is to just text any amount to that number on your screen, 940-241-4450. That's 940-241-4450. Of course, you can mail an offering in. Our mailing address is 806 Russell Palmer Road, Kingwood, Texas. And the zip is 77339. That's 806 Russell Palmer Road, Kingwood, Texas, 77339. Uh, you can also go to our website. It's Just go to clc-church.com. CLC, like Christian Life Center, hyphen church.com. And go to the little give uh, on, the, on the toolbar and click give. A menu will come down, and then you can give through PayPal that way. And, of course, my favorite way for you to give is to come by. Yeah, just drop by the office or come by one of the church services and, and put your offering in the offering bucket because we'd love to see you. We love you, and we care about you. And that's why I'm going to share this message with you this morning called Standing in the Midst of a Storm. Have you ever been in a storm, in a battle, maybe in something we call a, a crisis or a situation? Well, I want to talk to you about standing in the midst of a storm. I'm going to be reading from Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse 11. It says this, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Amen. But against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod, Take, with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you'll be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, 
praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. That's the Word of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your Word. Lord, hide your Word in our heart that will not sin against you, and let us be a reflection, Jesus, of your love and your light to our family, our friends, and our generation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have you ever gone through a trial? Maybe you're going through a struggle right now. You might call it a crisis or even a storm. Well, I want to share with you how to get victory, amen, in those crises. How to remain standing in the midst of a storm. I want you to get your breakthrough. I want you to fulfill your destiny. I want you to receive your promise and be above and not beneath. The head and not the tail. Riding and not walking. I want you to be blessed and not cursed, amen. I want you to be able to stand in the midst of a storm. In fact, that's the title of the message today. Standing in the midst of a storm. You know, in the past, I've spoken about faith. You know, I believe that faith plus works equals provision. Faith plus works equals answered prayer equals provision. You have to understand, faith without works produces nothing. James chapter 2 verse 20 says this, but wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? I mean, faith with no works is not faith at all. So we need to put feet to our faith today. But what I want to focus on right now is that believers go through struggles. You know, the Bible says, in this world, you shall have tribulation. Hello. I mean, that's true for all of us. In this world, it doesn't say you might have or you could have. It says you, you're going to go through a trial. If you haven't gone through one yet, you will. Amen. I kind of find that people are usually in one of three stages. They're either in the middle of a storm, or they're exiting a storm, or they're getting ready to enter a storm. That's usually where we are. Amen? You know, King David said this in the 37th Psalm. He said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Think about that. I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Now, before he said that, he said the following, beginning in verse 23. He said, The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. I've been young and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. See, in these verses, David is saying, you're going to go through trial. You're going to fall. You're going to fail. If you feel like you failed God and that you've fallen and you've messed up, hey, join the club. We all have. We all have failed God at one time or another. But if we choose to live right, in other words, if we, if we serve God, then when you're going through a difficult time, you don't have to worry because God is not going to forsake you. He's not going to abandon you. In our opening text, it seems like the Apostle Paul was focused on us standing. We will go through trials and tribulations, but keep standing. Amen. If you fall, get back up. In Ephesians 6.10, he says this, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. Notice he says again, I want you to stand. He says, I want you to be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand and stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Paul is saying, you're going to take some hits, but keep standing. Stand your ground. Keep your faith. I've had people tell me, Pastor, I'm going through hell. I understand, but if you're going through hell, for heaven's sake, don't stop. Amen. Don't quit. Keep going. Amen. The Bible teaches us that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, faith, it says faith is substance. Now, I learned through a friend of mine that works at the uh, Space uh, Technology Center at NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, that the word substance is a scientific term. If a scientist wants to establish a law, they have to use something called the scientific method. This method begins with a hypothesis or a guess. And that, that they observe and they test and they analyze things to determine or prove or disprove the existence of something. The word hypothesis comes from the same Greek word that substance comes from. It, it's the word, it's actually two words, hupo stao, which means beneath and to stand or understand. And if you think about it, that's what substance means also. Substance comes from two words. Sub, which means under or below, and stance, which means to stand. Faith is understanding why you believe what you believe. 
Faith isn't just believing something because you chose to believe it. I've had people tell me that, well, I just believe it because I choose to believe it. That's faith. I say, no, that's not faith. That's foolishness. That's why people worship trees and rocks and things, because they just choose to do it. That's not faith. Faith requires substance. Faith requires evidence. Years ago, I preached a message called, I Saw the Rabbit. In a nutshell, the message was about this. I had gone hunting one day with my brothers. Now, I was a little guy. I think I was maybe six years old, five or six. And the brother older than me, I think he was uh, around eight or nine. And then the brother older than him was 12. Now, the 12-year-old had the 22 uh, rifle, 22 caliber rifle. We were going rabbit hunting. And he was responsible. He knew, he knew how to use a rifle as a 12-year-old country boy. And then the nine-year-old, he had a BB gun. And he was kind of in training to, to learn to use a rifle. And then, and then I was five or six, and I had a stick. They couldn't trust me with anything, you know. And so we were walking across the, a field where it was a wooded area, kind of like this here. And uh, there was a, a pond there. We, we called it a tank. It was where the cattle came to, to drink water. And when we got there, they walked over to an area where water flowed into the tank. And, and I stayed on this side of the, the, the pond. And I looked down by this big oak tree. And when I looked down, I saw a big jackrabbit. He was eating acorns under this oak tree. And I saw his ears were a little bit flapped down. And, and I wanted to call to my brothers, but they were on the other side of the tank. And, and I couldn't just yell at them. That rabbit would run off. So I was waving my hands, you know, and they, they didn't see me. And so I picked up a rock and I, and I threw it. And when it hit the water, I looked and I saw that rabbit's ears go up. Boy, his ears perked up like this. And they turned to the right like a, like a radar, you know, turned to the right, turned to the left. He's listening. And then they went back down and he went down to eat again. So I knew that he didn't know I was there. But I got my brother's attention and they turned around and I, and I did like this. I, I, There's a rabbit over here. They're like, what? And I, and I said, rabbit over here you know and the, so they got what i was saying and they ran over well when they ran over i mean they stomped their feet on the ground and i turned and looked and that rabbit took off and they got there and they said what is it what is it i said well there was a jackrabbit here they said where i said it was right there under that tree they said i don't see a rabbit i said well he's not there now you guys made all kinds of noise running over here and they said ah there was no rabbit there and i said yes there was they said no there wasn't and they were trying to convince me that there wasn't a rabbit there, but I saw the rabbit. And they kept saying, ah, oh, you didn't see anything. And I said, hey, I saw the rabbit. I mean, they, they could argue with me all they wanted, but I saw the rabbit. See, I had faith because I had evidence. I had substance. I saw the rabbit. Hey, amen. And, I, and that's how it is in life. Sometimes people try to convince you, oh, Jesus isn't real. God isn't real. But listen, I've had an experience with God. Amen. I've heard his voice. I've felt his power. I've seen his. I saw the rabbit. Amen. I saw the rabbit. I want to tell you something. A person with an experience is never at the mercy with a, a person with an argument. Now, people can argue with you all they want, but if you've had an experience with God, nothing's going to shake your faith because I saw the rabbit. Amen. Amen. I have substance and evidence that gives me this faith. I've heard his voice. I've felt his power. I've seen his miracles. You can argue whatever you want. You can believe whatever you want, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Amen. Why? Because I felt his power. I've heard his voice. I felt his presence. I saw the rabbit. Amen. Amen. You see, you may be listening to me right now and you feel overwhelmed with problems. You might be right smack dab in the middle of a crisis or in the middle of a storm. Maybe you have a, have a tough time. Things aren't going the way they should. Maybe you're not making the money you think you ought to be making. Maybe your marriage isn't going the way you hoped it would go. Maybe you have family problems or personal problems. You're not happy with things. Let me tell you something. Tough times won't last, but tough people will. Did you hear what I said? Tough times aren't going to last, but tough people will. We all go through problems. But remember, when you're going through a problem, when you're going through hell, don't stop. Amen. Keep standing. Stand in faith, believing, because God's not going to forsake you. He's not going to abandon you. I want you to keep standing. See, one component of our faith is substance, understanding, the scientific term. Another component of our faith is evidence. Substance is a scientific term, and evidence is a legal term. You know, we know scientifically that faith is real, but we also have to have substance, and that's a, that's a legal term. If you, uh, or evidence, rather, that's a legal term. If you go to court and you say, well, this guy stole my chicken, and the guy says, I didn't steal his chicken, the judge is going to say, do you have any evidence? Do you have any proof that, that he did this? I was teaching my children about faith, and I told them that 
Faith is evidence of things not seen. I said, look up in the sky. I said, you see that, that steam trail in the sky? They said, yeah. I said, what do you think happened? They said, well, an airplane flew by. I said, how do you know? They said, because it made that trail. I said, well, how do you know? You, do you see an airplane? They said, no. I said, well, how do you know there was an airplane up there? They said, because we see the trail. I said, that's evidence of things not seen. And about that time, we heard some music. In the neighborhood, you could hear this music coming. And my daughter said, Dad, give me some money. I said, why? She said, give me some money. I want to buy an ice cream. I said, where are you going to buy an ice cream? There's nobody selling ice cream out here. She said, don't you hear that? I said, well, hear what? She said, that music. She said, that's the ice cream man. She said, give me some money. I said, how do you know there's an ice cream man? She said, the music. She said, evidence of things not seen. I said, amen. That's what it is. And I gave her the money. Amen. That's what faith is. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. And it's evidence. We may not be able to see this thing, but we have evidence of the, the truth of faith. Amen. So faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The first component, component of faith is substance, a scientific term. The second component is evidence, a legal term. So we have substance, we have evidence, and now there's a third ingredient that solidifies our faith, and that is witnesses. You know, if you're in the court and, and you say, hey, he stole my chicken, he says, no, I didn't. The, the, the judge is going to say, do you have any evidence? And you say, well, I, you know, at his house where he doesn't have chickens, there was chicken feathers everywhere. And the judge might say, well, that's some evidence, but uh, did anybody else see this happen? Do you have any witnesses? And, uh, and that'll make a difference, amen? Because if you say, well, yeah, my neighbor saw him carrying my chicken, and, uh, and his neighbor saw him carrying the chicken, and my son saw him running away with the chicken, and see, if you have two or three witnesses, after a while, the judge is going to say, you know what, we think you're telling the truth. And um, if, you, if all you have is some evidence, or all you have is some substance, but faith is the substance and the evidence, and we also have a cloud of witnesses. Deuteronomy says this in Deuteronomy 19, verse 15, One witness shall not rise up against a man for iniquity or for any sin, and any sin that uh, he sinneth. At the mouth of two witnesses, or at the mouth of three witnesses, witnesses shall a matter be established. In other words, you just have one guy on your side that says, well, I saw this. You might have you know, found a friend that says whatever you want. But if you have two or three witnesses, they're going to believe what you said. Amen? And the Bible says when you have several witnesses, that adds to the proof. And so we have faith. We have substance. We have evidence. And Hebrews 12 says this in verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and every sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Notice it says before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. How many of you have has God blessed in some way? How many of you have had a miracle take place just when you needed it? You know, those are witnesses. And these are three of the components of faith. Substance, evidence, and witnesses. So we have substance, we have evidence, and we have witnesses. And, and, and there's a fourth aspect, which is to watch where you're going. That's right, I said, watch where you're going. You can say it with me, say, watch where I'm going. See, faith seems to focus on our future. Think about it. You don't have faith in your past because your past is truth. It's, it's a fact. You don't have to have faith in that. You just have facts. You might call it faith in the tomb while there's faith in the womb. Amen. There's faith in things that are going to happen. We're, we're focusing on our future. Truth in the tomb or truth in the womb. In other words, truth that has already happened or truth that you know is going to happen because you have faith. You have substance. You have evidence. My daughter knew that ice cream truck was coming. Why? She had faith. She had the substance. She had the evidence. And she had witnesses. She knew plenty of times before that when you heard that music, the ice cream truck showed up. You know, they seem to focus on their future. Hebrews 12, 1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cause of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. That's the future. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. You know, it's good to know where we've been, but it's even more important. It's better to know where you're going. Amen. Truth in the tomb is historical truth, but truth in the womb is even better. Amen. It's good to know where you've been, but it's even more important to know where you're going. 
Watch where you're going. Faith requires us to focus on our future. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. That's, that's the future, things hoped for. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Our faith deals with things that we long for and we haven't seen yet. But we anticipate seeing them. Paul said this in, in Philippians 3.13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, that's the past, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, that's the future. I press toward the mark, the future, for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We need to watch where we're going, focus on our future. <clears throat> like I said, things may not be going so great right now. Maybe you feel like you're going through hell. Don't stop. You're somewhere in the future. And you look much better than you look right now. Amen? Focus on your future. Watch where you're going. You know, the reason we walk forwards instead of backwards is because God put our eyes in front, not in back. He could have put one eye in front and one in back if he wanted to. But for some reason, in his wisdom, he put both of our eyes in front so that we could watch where we're going. It's, it's good to know about your past, but it's more important to know where you're going. I mentioned earlier that, you know, some of you might be going through a difficult time. Maybe you failed at something. Maybe you're hurting. Consider Peter. You know, when Jesus was being questioned by the Sanhedrin prior to his crucifixion, Peter denied knowing Christ three times. How do you think Peter felt? Man, he let Jesus down. And, and maybe somebody's let you down. Or maybe you've let someone down. Have you ever failed God? Have you ever lied? Have you ever been unfaithful to the Lord or to someone else? How many times have we put our light under a bushel? Listen, we've all sinned. That's what the Bible says. I, I'm the first one to confess. I've sinned. I've failed God. I'm not proud of it, but it's happened. We've all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. <clears throat> but I want you to know something. Jesus died to wash your sins away. He went to the cross to wash your sins away, and not just your sins, but the guilt associated with it. Peter felt horrible. Sin has that effect on people. The Bible says he wept bitterly and he went out into the darkness. We don't even have a record that he was there when Jesus was being crucified. Peter was possibly at the lowest point of his life in those days between the death and resurrection of Jesus. I can only imagine the heartache that he must have suffered. He was broken, bitter, disillusioned. And even though he turned his back on Jesus, Jesus didn't turn his back on him. I want you to understand something. Jesus doesn't abandon you because you mess up. Jesus knows you don't wear a halo. He knows that you don't walk on the water. He knows that he had to die for your sins, and he did that because he loved you so much. He doesn't get rid of you. He doesn't boo you when you drop the ball, and he's never given up on you. He knows that you need his help, and he loved you so much that while we were yet sinners, Christ took our sins upon himself. He became sin for us, and he died on the cross of Calvary. You know, I could tell you testimony after testimony of the things that Jesus has done for me. There's been so many. He's gotten me out of trouble, out of financial bind. He's healed my children. He saved my marriage. He's given me peace and joy. You know, let, let me just give you one example of something that Jesus did. There's been so many. There really is. We wouldn't have time to, to go over them all here. But I remember one time when I was a young man, we, we, I was newlywed. Lisa and I had been married, I guess, not even a year yet. We bought our, our first home. And it was an old home in Chillicothe, Ohio. It was over 100 years old. It was on the historical map of the city. And when we went into the house to clean up, some of the walls had paneling. Now, if you're a young person, you probably don't know what paneling is. You can look it up or ask your parents about it. It was kind of a, a piece of wood, like a 4 by 8 piece of wood, that looked like planks of wood that went on your wall. And they were different colors. Some were dark wood. Some were light wood. Some were like gray or white. And they would make nails the same color of the wood so that when they nailed the wood to the wall, you couldn't see it. Well, anyway, long story short, we were cleaning off the paneling in this new house we bought. It was an old house that was new to us. And Lisa had a white uh, little cloth, uh, washcloth in her hand. And she sprayed the, the paneling and she started cleaning it like this. And when she went across to wipe it, there was a nail that had been broken and it was sharp on the edge. And when she ran her hand across, it just sliced her hand. And she said, ah, oh, she said, Jesus. And she squeezed her hand. I said, honey, what happened? She said, I cut myself. There was a nail in the wall. And I ran over to her and I took the cloth. There was part of it that was still clean. And I wiped the blood off of her hand. And when I wiped the blood off of her hand, I noticed that underneath the skin, you could see a line where the cut had happened. But there was no cut. 
Now listen to what I'm saying. The skin wasn't broken. Now it had to be broken. It bled. So I know that it was cut. But she closed her hand and said, Jesus, when she opened her hand, her hand was healed. And me, being a, a young minister and a man of faith, what do you think I did? I, I tried to open it back up. I, I couldn't believe it. You know, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I couldn't believe it. It, it, it was, it was, it had blood all over her hand. I wiped the blood off. And and I'm and it's not like the cut sealed real fast. I, I, there was never a scab of any kind, not a line. I tried to open the skin back up because I couldn't believe what I was seeing with my own eyes. It was healed completely. It, it, there was never a scab. There was never a line. It never itched. She just looked at it and said, "Richard, I think some. I think the Lord just healed my hand." And I looked at the rag, and there was the blood. And I looked at her hand, and underneath the skin, I could see a line where something had happened but her hand and that's just a little miracle i mean i've seen so many miracles like i said i could go on hour after hour to tell you about the, the things that jesus has done for me but one thing i do want to tell you is that what god has done for me and what jesus has done for me he'll do for you he's healed my children he's strengthened my marriage he's blessed our church he's he's, he's taken us through difficult financial crisis he's helped us through all kinds of issues and no matter what you're going through, I want to tell you something. No matter how big your problems are, God's bigger. God's bigger than any problem you have, bigger than any. He's bigger than cancer. He's bigger than AIDS. And He can heal you and He can help you if you just put your faith in Him. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says this. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Listen, if you're going through a struggle, don't stop. Keep going. Keep standing. Keep standing. Listen. If Jesus isn't Lord of your life, I want you to have an opportunity to invite him to be Lord of your life. It's the wisest, the smartest thing you could ever do. And it's real easy. All you have to do is say this prayer. It's a prayer of invitation. If you believe it in your heart and you confess it with your mouth, you will be saved. So just, if you want to do this, just repeat after me. Say, Dear Jesus, come into my life. Be Lord of my life. Forgive me of all my sins. Wash them away with your blood. Now say this, I accept you, Jesus, as my Savior and my Lord, and I make a vow to serve you as Lord of my life for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer with me, if you believe it in your heart, you confess with your mouth, you are saved. And you might say, Pastor, I didn't feel anything. It's not about feelings. It's not a physical thing. It's a spiritual promise. And if God said it, He keeps His promise. Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. If you'll let me in, I'll come in and I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Oh, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. And listen, don't forget, sow a seed into this ministry. That seed is going to come back to you, press down, shake it together, and running over. You can never outgive God. It's impossible because God said give and it's going to give, be given unto you. What's going to be given unto you? Whatever you give. You give financially, God's going to pour finances out upon you. Just, the easiest way to give is to text that number on your screen, 940-241-4450. That number again is 940-241-4450. Just text any amount to that number. It'll come to the church or bring an offering by or, or you know, mail an offering in. However you want to give, go to our website, clc-church.com. And listen, you have my permission to share this message with anyone, with your family, with your friends. Post it on your Facebook page, your YouTube channel, whatever you want to do. We want the word to get out that Jesus loves you. Amen. Thank you so much for watching. God bless you.